So hello and happy Friday. Welcome to Backyard Beekeeping Question and Answers, episode number 98. We're getting pretty close to 100 now. This is Friday, February the 18th. How cold is it outside? It's 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Very cold, consistently cold. How much is that in Celsius? Minus 5 degrees Celsius, for those of you who want to know in the rest of the world. You may not have heard, but parts of the United States are without power. In the cold, Texas. And if you're down there, I hope that power is restored to you soon, and I hope that your bees are doing okay. I know that a lot of people's bees are being exposed to temperatures that they otherwise would not have been. So being prepared for a climate shift like that is really unforeseen. Anyway, this is the way to be. So if you'd like to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description down below, and line item by line item, the topics will be mentioned there and also any associated links that might help you find out relevant information or a relevant product that we talk about. That's designed to help you find stuff. And uh, yeah, we have a weird situation because normally we get breaks in the weather and we get opportunities to get out there and check our bees and see how they're flying and things like that. Here in Northeastern United States, the state of Pennsylvania, we have consistent cold temps right down to the single digits over the past week, by the way. So hopefully we're going above freezing in the coming week, but we're headed into the weekend. So let's get on to the questions that were submitted over the past week by viewers of YouTube and people that comment on the Facebook page. So maybe you want to join a Facebook fellowship and talk to people day or night, share your pictures, share your ideas, or get an opinion about something that's going on with your bees right now. Because let's be honest, sometimes you can't wait for Friday for me to answer your question. So it's called The Way to Be fellowship and there's a link down in the video description and all you do is ask to join say where you heard about it and you're in there you go it's a growing fellowship of really good beekeepers there's always somebody there to talk to uh, the other thing is if you'd like to post a question of your own and you're not comfortable writing it in the comment section down below or maybe you don't have a youtube channel that's a problem for some people you can't make a comment if you don't have a youtube channel so follow a link that takes you to my website, thewaytobee.org, and there's a form there that you can fill out, and that comes to me, and you can be anonymous if you want to be. So then your question gets uh, considered for one of the Friday Q&As. What else should I tell you about? I think that's pretty much it for now. So at the very end, we'll have a little fluff discussion about non-important things. So we're going to get right into it with Justin Green, who gets the first question here. Can I put beeswax? one pound bar or something like that inside a 10 frame deep with a five frame nuke to give them additional resources to build up comb in late April. I can see where somebody might think that dropping a big chunk of beeswax in there might provide the bees with a resource that they would use to build up their new comb and things like that, but unfortunately that absolutely does not work. There's a reason why when we harvest out uh, the beeswax while we're inspecting colonies or we're scraping off the burr comb and things like that, we, we bring a bucket or a container of some kind with us and we collect all of that into the bucket. If the bees actually would grab used wax on the bottom of the hive and things like that and recirculate that and use that now to build their brand new comb and things like that, that might be easy, you know, in concept. But really, we want the bees to metabolize the materials that produce their beeswax, which comes through their wax production glands, which are on their abdomen, and there's four down each side. So there's eight of those glands, and we want them to make fresh wax. So your best way to actually facilitate that in the spring would be to provide them with plenty of one-to-one -one sugar syrup if they're just starting out and they're behind and they need that boost. That'll be clean wax. The other thing is some of that older wax that you get, um, especially if you've recycled frames that you've pulled out of your hive that have uh, comb in it that's been several years old, the comb is the liver of the hive and it collects all the toxins. Well, the bulk of the toxins. So it could have pesticides. It could have insecticides. It could have fungicides. It could have all kinds of things in it. And that's one of the reasons we want to rotate out the old stuff. So find something else to do with your block of wax, I would think. But the bees will not go down and just harvest it and reuse it that way. It's always best to give them the resources to make their own fresh new wax. The next question comes from Trevor Ball. I meant to ask, although I know to increase hive size in spring, 
sometimes two or three brood supers other than doing splits before winter towards the end of autumn. How do you reduce the hive size back to one brood super? Sorry if you've already answered this. Well, sometimes we do re-answer questions that have been covered in the past because they're of such universal concern that it's worth talking about again and again sometimes. So, but when it comes to a single deep going into winter, the only bees that I keep in a single deep going into winter would be a late season swarm because they're just not big enough to police a space and maintain a space larger than that. But my standard configuration going into winter is going to be a medium super and at least one deep. So now I might have a deep and two supers. So one of the things is, how do you reduce the hive size back to one brood super? Well, I don't reduce it to one if they're bigger already. I reduce it down to two. Well, it is one brood and one super, so it's two boxes. Uh, sometimes I can't. You know, we get into late September, mid-October, and I'm looking at uh, the last of the honey's been harvested. We always make sure, I do, uh, to allow the bees to build up and give me at least 50 to 60 pounds of honey before there's what I declare to be surplus honey that I could take off, use for myself, sell, give away, things like that. So they build that up first because I don't know what the year is going to bring. You know, so if I took off all the honey expecting a great honey flow, which normally happens in uh, mid-September here, uh, and what if it didn't happen? What if they didn't get a chance to build up? What if they didn't have the honey reserves they need to get through winter? Because that's the goal of the bees from spring on they have, they want to reproduce, they want to bring resources in that they can reproduce from, and they want to store up enough resources to get themselves through winter. That's what they're trying to do the whole time. The good news is they're hoarders, so they collect much more than they need to get through. That's why we end up taking honey off. But if they never reach that goal, if they never reach that big surplus, we don't take anything off. So then at the end of the year, sometimes they end up with a colony that might have three boxes on it and all those boxes are full of bees. I can't condense them down. Just too many bees. I like to see them down in two boxes for a well-established colony and that's because they tend to winter better that way. So, but if, if the bees are populated and the frames are full, you're not going to be able to condense it down to a single box. The single box, as I said, is a late season swarm, something like that. And they do, by the way, make it through. What do they need on top of that single brood box? They need a feeder shim because colonies that go into winter like that have not stored the resources that they need to make it. And it's going to be up to you to feed them. And we're going to talk about feeding a little bit later in today's Q&A. So sit tight for that. Get your notebook out. Next is from John Kessel. This spring will be my first year with honeybees. I'm trying to figure out what are the determining factors when choosing the size of your brood chambers. You seem to favor one deep and one medium. A lot of beekeepers in my area, Kentucky, seem to choose two deeps. Can you talk about what factors we should use when making this decision for our hives and what benefits each setup may offer us? Thanks. Well, the thing is that a lot of people like to practice bottom box rotations in spring. To do that, your bottom boxes, your brood box, which is a deep for no matter what hive you're setting up. There's a handful of people out there that are doing everything with mediums from you know your brood boxes all the way up. I don't endorse that move at all. Um, so what I do are a deep box minimum. That's the start. Now, some people like to in the spring, remove an upper box, make it the bottom box, pull the bottom box out altogether, and put that on top of that one. If you're doing that, it makes sense that your boxes be the same size. And since a minimum size for a brood box is a deep, doesn't matter what Langstroth kit you're buying, where it's coming from, who makes it, Daydunt, Better Be, whoever's selling it, Man Lake, they always come with the bottom box being the deep, and that's because that matches up best with the brood size, with what they're going to need to produce. So then I do the mediums because, again, we're following Dr. Thomas Seeley's guidance here. I have to give that a few seasons to see if it works out. That's what I'm doing. Started it last year, so I'm condensing all my hives down to two boxes going into winter as much as I can. I do have a couple that were just too big. And uh, I have no plans to rotate the bottom boxes. 
to shift them. I'm not going to take an upper box, make it the bottom box and so on. Instead, in spring, when uh, the nectar starts flowing and everything else and it warms up and they have a single entrance through the bottom, again, the other thing I'm following is no venting through the top. So when there's no place for the brood in the upper box to be properly vented as the temperatures rise, they naturally migrate down to where the ventilation occurs, which is the main entrance. And in my case, a single entrance with no venting. So that means as the queen, because coming up very soon, uh, they're going to start producing brood if they haven't already. And as temperatures warm, they will want to move their brood closer to the entrance. If we leave an upper entrance or an upper vent, then what is their initiative? What inspires them to move down to that lower box again? Nothing really, other than waiting for the nectar flow. And then as those resources fill in, we just think in theory, they'll start to migrate down closer to that entrance later, but they might stay high in the top. You don't know what they're gonna do. But uh, I don't rotate the boxes. So that's why I use the deep and mediums above that. Now, where do I make an exception to the upper box being deep? Once I have the brood box at the bottom, then I have at least a medium, the next box up. Once that's full of honey, and I call that the honey bridge. The queen generally won't go up above that. Why? There's no ventilation up there anyway. She doesn't want to take and lay eggs up there and have open brood and have her larvae cared for in an area that's not well ventilated. So she's not encouraged to go over that honey bridge and that's when I put on a flow super or an upper honey super. And big surprise, I don't use uh, queen excluders. So does that mean I tell you not to use queen excluders? No, I tell you to use them until you get used to the rhythm of your bees. See what's going on. See how well that uh, honey bridge works. See if the queen is apt to get up there and lay a few stray eggs. But in general, bees are efficient. They want to keep their cluster together. They want to keep their brood together and they want all that neatly organized so their food and resources and pollen and everything else are right there so the nurse bees can continue to take care of them. And then the upper boxes become for honey. And that's why we exploit that tendency by putting flow supers and other supers above that. So I hope that works. And I don't rotate them because you shift their brood pattern too, because the brood, if it bridges up a little bit into that medium box, you take that medium box off and bake at the bottom, guess what you just did? Part of the brood is now at the very bottom and we've disrupted their own uh, brood layout. So uh, disrupting that as little as possible is also another goal that we have. Next question is from Robert Kajor. Kajor. What is the point of slats in a slatted rack? Wouldn't five centimeter shims between floor and brood box work? Essex, United Kingdom. Okay, well, the slatted racks, um, the reason they have slats in them, why not just make a big space underneath your Langstroth box? Between the bottom board and your brood box, just make a shim and have a big open space down there. Well, the thinking of the slatted rack, first of all, slatted racks are two inches tall. And I went, I was going to get one out and show it to you today, but guess what? Every slatted rack that I own is in a hive out in the apiary right now, so I didn't have one to show you, so... I had to do a drawing. So here's my drawing of what a slatted rack kind of looks like. It's a shim that's two inches thick. It is generally pine. It has a leading board that's flush with the top of it. So there's space underneath this board right here. And then that, the entrance would be under it right here, which means that this board helps reduce some of the wind gusts and things that come through. It also makes the entrance a little darker and this allows the bees in the box above the queen might lay lower and everything else. But if this did not have slats in it, this particular one is an eight frame. If these eight slats did not exist, then this would just be an open space underneath. And now the bees might be inclined to make some burr comb underneath the frames that are just hanging down in that entrance area. So by having the slats there, the thinking is they maintain bee space. The bees would move through here. It adds a ventilated area. It adds an area for the bees to congregate. They can even congregate underneath this piece of wood right here. And uh, it's supposed to cut down on some of the bearding, which is bees collecting outside the hive. And so if it's just an open space, it doesn't meet those requirements. So, and I put slatted racks on most of my hives now because I use it 
uh, as a utility space. And if I need to do an oxalic acid vaporization treatment, I go through a quarter inch hole right through the back of the slatted rack, and then I don't have to worry about uh, drilling holes in my boxes, for starters. So that's the thinking, just to use bee space, the slats are just to fill space, and then the bees move down through there. And uh, that's it. So I've been using those for a few years. Nice to have. I don't notice a huge difference in uh, bearding for those that have the slatted racks and those that don't. So I don't know that the space really provides a lot for that, but I have a lot of viewers, and that's one of the cool things about YouTube. I can get feedback from people all over the country and the world. Uh, an example is where that question is coming from, the United Kingdom. So in other areas, the bees might use this laddered rack space for unoccupied foraging bees to gather rather than on the front of the hive where they beard when they're dehydrating honey, when the uh, space is exploding with the numbers of bees, there's a rainstorm and all the foragers are in, but the hive can't accommodate them anymore because they need to get them out of the way so they can work. Specifically in the brood frames where the nurse bees are doing the best they can, they don't need a bunch of idlers sitting around occupying space because what else do the bees do when they're inside the hive and they've got nothing to do? They're respirating, so they're contributing moisture in there. They're also generating their own body heat through their activity. So they're actually adding to a problem, climate control inside the hive. Now in the wintertime, we want them in there because we use their bodies, the bees use their bodies as insulators. So then they want them, and then they're going to start dying off as they get older. We're going to talk about that later today, too. So that's that, slatted racks. Next one comes from Michael Roberts in Lusby, Maryland. I uh, fed two to one sugar syrup and pollen sub patties. The hive built up nice and had some stores built up for the winter, but not enough to sustain them. So I filled a round hive feeder with dry sugar, as you and others suggested as an emergency backup plan. My bees starved to death and did not appear to have touched the dry sugar. There were no stores left in the hive and many bees had their heads in the comb. I also found the queen, so it was not a queenless, so it was not queenless and appeared to be healthy, as I did not find mites. Is there a reason why dry sugar will not work? Does the colony have to be a certain size, or does there need to be enough condensation, or the weather to be cold enough with a large enough cluster to produce condensation for the bees to utilize the dry sugar? Is there something better than dry sugar to use in winter in Maryland on smaller hives? or when water is scarce. Okay, so the first thing that jumps out at me about this comment, first of all, a lot of new first year beekeepers and things uh, are gonna be losing a lot of bees this year. And sometimes there's not always an explanation, but sometimes there are. So we follow the statistical successes, right? So one thing that we know for sure that I see right here, I feed two to one sugar syrup and pollen sub patties. If you're feeding pollen sub patties, those are high protein patties, pollen subs are designed to take the place of pollen to help with brood rearing in the absence of real pollen. So pollen sub patties fed in the fall, in my opinion, and supported by scientific study has shown that that's not a good move. Because if we encourage the bees to build a two to one syrup going into the end of the year, and if we encourage them to build brood a time of year when they otherwise would not be, because they need to match what's going on outside the hive, they need to match what's being provided in the environment. I like my bees to dwindle in numbers going into fall, and I want the winter bees to be healthy, but we don't want to artificially stimulate brood production at a time when they should be going into a state of torpor. Because now we create a demand for resources in the hive. If they're producing brood going into winter, then now their demands for resources inside the hive are out of sync with what the environment's going to provide. And artificially people do that by putting in pollen sub patties, high protein patties, or they put in actual pollen patties going into fall. And I'd like to point you to Scientific Beekeeping by Randy Oliver, who did studies of that, and he got feedback. Uh, and shared it where not only did it not help the bees, which is what I was putting out, it simply doesn't help. It doesn't improve anything and creates an artificial demand for resources so it doesn't build the colonies. Uh, but actually, it proved to be detrimental 
So go to Scientific Beekeeping uh, by Randy Oliver and look up fall feeding and pollen subs and pollen patties and see what the detrimental effects were. So that's the first thing that jumped out at me. We may have artificially built more demand for resources than the colony otherwise would have needed to get through winter. Uh, the other thing is about the sugar syrup, not sugar syrup, but dry sugar as an emergency feed. When are they going to use it? My bees right now wouldn't be up there. They could not make use of dry sugar. So your very first line of defense is always letting the bees build up and have the resources that they need to get through winter in the form of honey stores. This also happens going into fall that the bees get into this big last boost, this last nectar flow. And some people become concerned about uh, the queen becoming honey bound. She doesn't have anywhere to lay because all the cells get filled with honey and there's no place to lay an egg. Uh, where for me, I don't worry about that at all. The queen is there, her retinue of helpers is there, all the nurse bees are there, and I don't care going into fall if they fill every cell with the last remnants of nectar and pollen they can find in the environment. Because they're doing that on their own, those resources exist naturally, I didn't provide it for them. And then now we have clusters of bees parked over capped honey or even open cells of honey that were collected at the last minute in the season. Now they're gonna consume the honey in the cells underneath that cluster first. So immediately they're already opening up cells directly under them, it's directly immediate to them, and the heat inside that cluster exceeds the temperature that they need to metabolize sugars. So it has to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm gonna talk about this a little later on another subject too. But so the honey resources really have to be there. Now then the other thing is on days when we get these breaks, and this is why this year it's going to be a huge challenge for my own bees. Uh, they do have enough honey on, first of all. So that's the first step. Number one step is survival. 50 to 60 pounds. Some people even say 100 pounds of honey. So you're not wasting it if the bees use it through winter. And then you can draw it off in spring if there's a bunch of surplus. But leave it on for them to use those resources because they're gonna migrate up as a cluster. They're terrible at spreading out and using resources that are parked in corners. Even a feeder in a rapid round is described here that's got dry sugar in it on top. That only works on days when we get warm breaks. Historically, and this is why it's really important to keep records of what goes on in your area, we have weird weather this year. There are people, as I mentioned before, across the United States right now that got this snow belt that came through drove the temperatures way down. I don't know if you saw the videos of the people, they were even collecting reptiles. Uh, iguanas were falling out of trees in Florida because they're just freezing and then they plop down on the ground. And sea turtles are stuck. And so they're putting them in these huge spaces where they're warming them up to save their lives. So we have a weird climate shift right now. And if a lot of people in Southern states don't save a lot of resources for their bees to get through winter the way we do up North. And so then when the bees are in torpor or when they're trapped in there and they have to be stuck directly over the resources that they're gonna consume, they can easily starve out. So they'll move as a cluster up. And if we get these warm breaks, which historically we used to, which haven't happened this year. So if I get a day in the 50s, 60s, bees can fly out, do cleansing flights and inside the hive the cluster loosens and the worker bees inside the hive start to access things like the emergency dry sugar. Dry sugar in a feeder on top of your inner cover or in your feeder shim, as I use here, uh, is worthless to the bees unless it's warm enough for them to get up there into it. They can only consume and warm resources that are directly in contact with the bees. That's why the frustrating thing for brand new beekeepers and old beekeepers alike is that when they open a colony in spring and find out that they starved out, as, as described here, there's a queen, there's all the workers are there, and they're buried in the cells, and three or four inches away, there's capped honey, and they didn't use it. So this isn't necessarily just about the, the rapid round feeder of dry sugar, which is a supplement, an emergency feed. It's about the bees being unable to move because... Uh, it's not warm enough for the cluster to open up enough to gather those resources and or move to the resources. This is also why sometimes 
when people open a, a hive in spring, where's the cluster of bees? Center, center? Nope. They find them generally off to one side, up on the top, tucked against one of the walls. And one of the walls that they're tucked against generally is going to be where the sun rises. See what it did? Because some people in the Southern Hemispheres, they don't like it when it say Southeast and South and things like that. So they're going to face the sunrise and wherever the sun is during winter time. Those walls are where the cluster moves. Why? Because now they're taking advantage of the heat that warms the hive. This is where we get some discussion too about insulated hives, non-insulated hives, the super insulated hive. When that sun comes up on those winter days and warms the outside of the hive, that heat does not transfer into that interior wall the way it does on the uninsulated hives where it warms it up better and then the bees move to that and they use the resources right there. Bad news is uh, then the cold comes again and now they're stuck right there. So if they're already in the very top of the colony, now some of them actually, if your top roof is insulated, they might you might find that when you open up that wrapping around feeder, all your bees are in it because that's their last stand for resources. So this is not a simple thing uh, and weather extremes can change everything. But when people say the bees starved to death, did not appear to have touched the dry sugar. Some people find dead bees up in the dry sugar too, only to take them out and find out they weren't dead. They were just shocked by the cold. But uh, yeah, the moisture, the condensation goes up through the center. This is the little yellow version of it. This is not the wrap it around that I use, but we'll use this as an example. The heat from the bees rises up through the center. This should be out. Some people were leaving this in for winter. When you have dry sugar, that center cone should be out. And the only cover that you have is this one. Then the bees get up in here and you'll see condensation form on the inner surface of this cover. And then that condensation also translates to your dry sugar that's in here in this trough. And that becomes a solid block of sugar and you'll find bees parked on that. But it needs to be warm enough for the bees to get up there and use it. Number one, stored honey. Number two, emergency resources and feed. If you have to take apart your hives, to get in there to give them emergency feed. And we're gonna talk about some feed options too, also today. But uh, I think that some people are dealing with situations that are unique. And we also need to know what the mite counts are going into winter, uh, late fall. Some people are very comfortable not doing any kind of mite checks to find out what the loads are. They just look good going into winter. I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm saying that there's a rash of new beekeepers that are doing a hands-off approach and they have no idea everything looks good everything looks fine but if you haven't determined whether or not they're dealing with mites in late summer they may go into winter already diseased by a mite infestation without even without you even knowing and in every other way they can function normally they can look great in fact my greatest concern is not with the small colonies of bees going into winter it's the huge ones because they're the ones that had the most production. They're the ones that have the biggest area inside. And they're the ones the queen pheromone is the weakest because it has to go through all of those bees. And all of those bees generate heat, generate humidity, generate moisture. And there's going to be a lot more of them dying as we go into winter. So, and dead bees in the bottom of the hive. What do they do? They're moist. They generate moisture into the hive and they start to decompose. And they also start to get mold on them and things like that. And all of these things that happen on the interior of the hive, the bees are having to deal with, as well as keeping themselves warm and dry, preserving an area that has resources so that they can start uh, developing brood in spring. So it's much more complex than a lot of people think. Next comes from Rick from Riverton, Utah. The worker bees live about five to six weeks. This ties right into what we were just talking about. The worker bees live five to six weeks during the spring and summer, but the fall workers live till spring. What is the difference between the two? Is it metabolism or is it some sort of genetic difference? I grabbed one of your way to be hoodies and I love it. Way to be hoodies. By the way, underneath this video, those shirts and things like that and coffee cups. That's what we're talking about. Anyway, so what's the difference between the two? Well, this is interesting because going to fall, and we touched on this a little bit before, in preparation for winter, 
The bees have a natural rhythm and this can kick in even when it's not winter time. A lot of people don't realize this. The bees make what's called fat bodied worker bees. Fat bodied bees do not forage. Fat bodied bees are raised at the end of the year when food and resources are at a premium. These are going to be the healthiest bees, the fattest bodied bees in the hive throughout the year. So they produce them, what stimulates them to produce them as the pollen, nectar, and things like that start to decline in the environment. So once again, our intervention with our bees can stimulate them to make them think that there's more food and resources available than there are, and the fat bodied bee development can be delayed. So these fat bodied bees are different. Um, other than the fact that they don't forage, they store fat differently. So they have lipids throughout their body. So they store fat, their abdomens are big and extended. They store fat and resources in their thorax. They store fat, they have more fat cells than normal worker bees, say in midsummer. But here's another interesting thing, uh, if you want to go down the rabbit hole on that a little bit. Those worker bees, uh, who decides to make fat bodied bees? The nurse bees. What stimulates them? Environmental cues. So in midsummer, if you're in an area where suddenly there's going to be a dearth and the resources start to dwindle, in a struggle for survival, the nurse bees start to produce fat bodied worker bees to get them through the dearth. That's interesting. And by the way, I only learned that this past year. So 2020. Uh, that they can actually do that because those bees can continue to feed open larvae in the absence of stored pollen and resources. That's some interesting stuff. So fat bodied bees, aside from workers, because remember they don't forage, they don't burn themselves out. Their entire job, their entire function in the hive is to make sure that there are nurse bees and that's them, the fat bodied bees. They're going to attend the brood. They're also going to attend the queen. They're going to make sure she doesn't expire. So the last things that will be given resources in that hive are going to be the brood in winter. That is what we're going to depend on to get that colony going in spring and the queen herself. So these fat body, they are different. And uh, you need to look it up and read about it to know all the details, all the physiology of a fat bodied honeybee that goes through winter and survives several months instead of a few weeks. So they are different and they store a lot of fat and they're the ones that are going to feed the brood and they're going to guarantee the survival of the hive. This is why it's so critical to make sure that your bees going into fall are not dealing with a varroa infestation, that they're not getting those pathogens passed down, diseases from the varroa, which are going to translate right into your fat bodied bees and maybe not, not make them so fat. They won't have the resources that they need to continue that colony through winter. That is your guarantee right there. And then we're going to help them out in spring if we can, if they need it. So that's it. Genetic differences. And thank you, by the way, for getting one of my hoodies. Those are all my designs, by the way. Okay, next one comes from Susan Tong. I hope you're doing well. Patiently waiting for spring. One of my questions another attendee asked was regarding prophylactic use of oxalic acid vaporization with a new package of bees. Your answer seems very plausible, waiting nine days after installation and then addressing the hive with the OA treatment. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't have my notes handy. I'm in New Hampshire, agricultural zone 5B, and was thinking of using a deep medium for initial buildup, as Dr. Seeley and you have mentioned, and this is what we talked about earlier in today's Q&A. I will be receiving my packages in mid-April. Once both of those boxes are full, I was thinking of putting on a Flow Super uh, one and one Ross rounds on the second. Any thoughts? Okay, so now this is after the deep brood box is full. And by full, I mean if it's a 10 frame, if you've got eight or nine frames of bees, that's full. Put the next Super on. That Super gets full and capped with honey. The next box above that, going into a nectar flow. This is the other thing, time it with nectar flows. Uh, so that the bees have time to work these things up. So here's the thing. So if you're going to put Ross rounds on there, and I did that, we did a video about that, showing you how to do Ross rounds. I did that during a peak nectar flow on the strongest colonies of bees, and they were an absolute success across the board. 
Flow Supers again, I only put that on. These are Flow Hives. If you want to know about those, look down in the video description. I'll give you a link to them. When you put that box on, it should be on the strongest colony also so that they start to work them. There's nothing wrong with this philosophy here. This is all good to go, but it depends on when your area's strongest nectar flow is going to be. Now, I do tend to put them on if I have a strong colony, they're super productive, because what am I relieving by adding another box up there? I'm relieving one of the stimulants for them to swarm out. So by relieving congestion, giving them a place to go, plus they're going to work those frames. They have a lot of work up to do on the Ross rounds. They have a lot of work up to do. And for those who don't know, Ross rounds are a form of comb honey. There's hog halves and there are a couple others, but Ross rounds, hog halves are probably the most uh, common that you're going to hear about. And all of my colonies that I put them on built them out fantastic. Had a great year last year for flow hives too. So we don't know what the weather's going to do, but yeah, that sounds like a very good plan to put those right on. And uh, since you have gone through the pain and trial and error for us, and let's see, I realize that there are many factors to come into play, such as race and behavior of bees, nectar flow, my ability to be a good beekeeper. My biggest concern is making sure that they have enough resources to get through winter. Those resources are established when they fill that bottom box and they fill that medium super, at least here. If you're further north, you're going to need more than that. And uh, I do plan on using a feeder shim, of course, your feeder shim. I, or, all my hives have feeder shims except one this year. I ordered my rapid rounds from the Blythewood Bee Company. Good company, by the way. They're the people that make uh, Swarm Commander and things like that as well. And the majority of the remaining equipment that I will need will be from Better Bee. Betterbee.com. I do have a question in regards to video 59. I believe that it is the correct number. You showed a beautiful diagram of a brood box using three better comb frames two acorn heavy wax foundation, assuming in wood frames, and then four foundationless frames. This only accounts for nine frames. Did you use two follower boards, one on each? No, uh, I have to think off the top of my head, but I don't like to put nine frames in a 10 frame box. I like to do 10. But that particular box was a collection of a bunch of different frame styles because we're testing and evaluating them. But generally, in an eight frame box, I want eight frames in there. If there's a 10 frame box, I like to put 10 frames in there. And by the way, all the frames described here were all drawn out, all used. The foundation list were drawn out perfectly. Everything worked great. And uh, as we know, Better Comb has become a staple for getting things kicked off fast and early. So everything worked, but uh, that's it. If, if there were just nine frames, it's just because I was evaluating them, but my standard practice is to put 10 in 10, eight in eight, and so on. Currently take an online class from Better B. By the way, Better B, if any of you are looking at, and this is bad because I'm also one of the instructors at thebeekeeper.org, if you want to check that out. But Better B sent out a flyer. They're boosting their educational program. And they've just brought in a professor from Cornell University to run their education program. So Better Bee is one of those websites. They're not just selling bee stuff. They're educating people. Their education program is expanding. And the quality of their instructors is way up there. So uh, that's a good class to check out. Penn State offers classes. A lot of other people offer classes. So I'm not saying that one is totally better. I'm just saying the better bees on the rise. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for this week. So far, so good. I have, I believe I will be sharing your channel with the class on Wednesday. Thank you so much. The other thing is we're Zooming all the time now. So that's the explanation about the frames. I'm glad you're going to the better bee class. I was very impressed with the credentials of their new instructor there. It wasn't somebody I'd heard of, but... Uh, looks good on paper, so they should be doing good things. Here's the next question. It comes from Dirk Booms, and this is Downington, Pennsylvania. We have a small farm and our first year beekeepers in our first winter. Our two hives stayed alive and strong this long, but we had snow two weeks ago, and it's still on the ground. Every day, bees come out and die. We know about cleansing flights, etc., but the bees came out regularly before the snow. 
So not sure why so many die every day? Lots of poo. Yes, so it could be dysentery? I know there's a lot of people see bee diarrhea on the front of their hives, especially this time of year when they get to warm up and the bees fly out and they excrete immediately as soon as they get out there. And they go, oh, nozema. It's not necessarily nozema. It's just diarrhea. They had four bran muffins. They drank a bunch of coffee. They got stuck in traffic and you didn't want to be around them when they ran into that uh, rest area bathroom. So anyway, they're just eliminating as soon as they get out. Expect to see it, especially in a year like this. The other thing is, you know what's interesting about that? Uh, the lighter color the honey is that the bees have in their uh, frames going into winter, that means the fewer minerals and content is in the honey. So the lightest, the clearest, uh, gives them less dysentery, less diarrhea than, say, buckwheat honey that would be really dense and rich that would give them more material in their gut that they would have to get rid of later. So that's kind of interesting too. And what gives them the cleanest? Well, you're not gonna give sugar syrup in winter, so don't fall for that. But regular sugar, uh, when they can access it, when they can use it, as we described before, they need above 50 degrees to metabolize it. If they can get to that, that causes the least problems in their gut. So it's interesting stuff. So even when it's freezing, they still come outside. Some fly out quite far on our property. So is this still normal behavior for winter? Probably a few thousand have died in the last two weeks. We had bad snow in December too, and this didn't happen with the bees then. Many thanks, Dirk. So here's the thing. I go out in my bee yard, which right now has about a foot and a half to two feet of snow, depending on where you step. I am encouraged when I see a hive that's got four or five dead bees in the snow in front of it. And I look for them on the landing board too. And I have this portable vacuum cleaner that I carry with me now that has a little container in it. So the bees don't go to a filter. They just spin in this little container. So I vacuum them off the landing boards as I go now. And uh, a few like that it's good news because they're alive in the hive. Now, as I mentioned earlier this year, I went down to look at one hive in the lower field and there was a huge amount of activity. And I thought, ah, oh, that's good news. You know, when the weather get these late season warm spells, they're just out looking for everything. That's great. That shows strong colony. They're looking for resources. They're good to go. But what I quickly figured out on that colony was the reason that they're so active is they have already going into winter use their resources. So that meant they were desperate to get scouts out, desperate to find some resources somewhere to bring in. And had I not noticed that right then, I would not have been able to put resources on that hive that would help build them last minute before they go into winter. And again, we're gonna talk about some things you can do if you've not planned well for your bees or you've got lay season bees that just consumed everything and didn't save anything. Bees don't follow all the standards. So um, that's a lot of dead bees. So the other thing is, how do you know if, if that colony might be in trouble? We don't want to pop the lids unnecessarily on hives, but you can lean on the hive. You can try to tip it. You can give it a little lift test and uh, find out if it's a lightweight hive, because if they've got plenty of resources, it's still going to be plenty heavy, 60 to 100 pounds. My colonies generally come out in spring with about 20 pounds surplus left on. So if I went by a hive and went to tip it, and oh, it's really light and it's just basically the weight of the bees and empty comb in there, something has to be done. You're going to have to do some emergency feeding. So my concern with this description is if you have, this is where having other hives to compare it to are very important too, because we see some hives are very inactive, normal things, but this hive just seems to be booming at a time when there's nothing out there. They could actually be desperate for resources. That's a hive to pay attention to. Thousands of bees dead in the snow is a large number, in my opinion. So that colony is worth looking at and finding out where the cluster is. And you may have to be prepared to put some emergency feed on. Next question, Robert, Southampton, Ontario, Canada. I have four laying hives, it says. I think they're layans. I have four layans hives that I want to switch to long hives. 
Alliance is a long hive too, but I think now we're talking long Langstroth hives that I just built. I also want to recondition and change my existing long so all the bees will be moved. The problem is not far, only between three and six feet from where the entrances are now. Do I have a big problem? Thanks for any advice. Okay, this and this isn't just an issue because they're long langs where we're shifting out of the lands hive and going into the long langs, which I'd be interested in knowing why we're making that shift, lands to long lang. Frames aren't compatible, the sizes are different. So moving, you know, it's not just pulling frames and sticking them in the other hive because now they're different sizes. This is a, a lands frame, look how big it is. It doesn't match a long lang frame. So you can't just pull this out of a lands full of bees, brood and everything else and stick it in the long lang. So that's one issue that has to be overcome. The other thing is um, three feet. Why are we moving three feet? So in other words, do you actually like the position that your lands hives are in and you're just moving three feet because you have another hive you're gonna set out and then it's convenient to transfer things. Because in a perfect world, the easiest transfer is to, you're going to need friends, first of all, because these hives are heavy. My Long Langstroth hive, I can't move that on my own. So my goal would be to set up sawhorses, pull the existing hive, lift it up, set it on the sawhorses, put your new hive right where the old one exists, and then transfer those resources into the new hive right there and then just get the old hive out of there altogether once you've shaken all the bees out or whatever it is, whatever your method is that you're going to use. But if your heart is set on moving them three to six feet, you are gonna have somewhat of a, tr a problem, but it's winter time. So your chances of moving them without having masses of bees flying to the wrong spot are much better this time of year. But we're opening hives and transferring everything. So I have to guess that we're gonna do this in springtime which is going to be their most productive time. So here's the practice, and you may not like this at all. Since we're going, let's say the six feet, your heart's set on it, there's a patio built, there's a bunch of infrastructure, and this is just where that new hive has to be. I would actually say, take the existing hive away, miles away, to some other property, somebody else who doesn't mind, and park it there for a couple of weeks. Then, at night, pack up that hive, bring it back, transfer all the stuff into the new hive in the new location, and you want to have a bunch of scouts that don't know where to go, don't know where they live, going back to the old spot and so on. So that's my recommendation. Or you can put your new hive right next to the old hive, transfer everything over, and move them a foot or two a day until it's in the spot where you want it to be using sawhorses and stuff like that. So that works too. But if you're going to make the jump, from right there to six feet, you'll end up with a lot of bees that don't know where they live once they've been out foraging and everything else. And again, I'm making the assumption that this is going to happen when the weather's warm and all the resources are kicking and it's a time of increase for the bees that are in that colony. So that's my advice. My big problem with the Lands hives and the horizontal long Langstroth hives, if you have not made that commitment yet, I'm leaning heavy towards the long Langstroth hive, long Langstroth hive design, just because of the compatibility of the equipment. There's no, there's one source for a honey extractor for those deep lands frames. The lands hives are not compatible with anything but other lands hives. So if you've got a collection of hives that are Langstroth based, so if you've got Langstroth verticals, if you've got a flow hive, if you've got you know, these other hive, a Hoover hive, whatever company you got them from, all of those frames are interchangeable 100%. Go to my Langstroth, horizontal Langstroth, I can transfer frames into that, I can move all the bees out of one hive into a Langstroth, no hiccups at all. But now here comes the Layens hive, deeper frames, they don't match anything, you have to custom adapt the whole deal. So it's, I mean, I'm testing it through the year, but I see extensive compatibility problems when it comes to transferring from one hive to another, and that's what Robert's doing here. But I would be curious to know, why are we getting away from the lands now? What happened? What's wrong? Why are we going into long langs instead of lands? That's the interesting part. Next one comes from DJ, Los Angeles, California. 
The creosote cleaning video shows you having many smokers. Which one is your favorite? If not a favorite, which one would you recommend as the one smoker to rule them all for backyard beekeepers who will properly end up with maybe one or two smokers at most? Well, it is true. I went nuts and I have kind of every smoker that they make. And I did this video to show how to clean up your smokers, get the creosote out and all that. Let me, I can tell you right now what I don't recommend is the power smokers. I don't recommend the smokers that have built in lighters and they run on batteries and they have the little blower in it and you light it up. That is unnecessary complication. And guess what? Inevitably your batteries, if it's got built in batteries and it requires charging, those things cost a pile by the way. Don't do that. Don't get one of those. Just my, just my recommendation. So if that's your favorite smoker and you want to spend the money and you freshen the batteries and you like having an igniter built in and it has the blower and all that, do it. But if you're a brand new beekeeper and you're just going for the practical end of things, I don't recommend the power smokers. So I just happen to have this smoker here. Da, 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 da. Everybody has their favorite smoker. I'm one of these people to keep in mind, unless it's cooler weather, I don't even use these. So they're just hanging on a rack. And that's because I use a sugar sprayer, 50-50 sugar water with uh, teaspoons of Honey Bee Healthy or something else in it, essential oils. And uh, that's what I use in hot weather. I don't smoke the bees at all. So anyway, this is the design I like. It doesn't matter where you get it from or who you buy it from. I like the smokers that have a basket in them like this. They've got this little standoff screw at the bottom which means that this is up off the bottom, so the fresh air coming in circulates through the entire bottom instead of just going straight into the side. So we have, have a removable basket that we can load with fuel for the smoker. That's one thing I like. The next thing I like is look at the cone that is going to blow the smoke out. There is a spark arrester in there. So when you've got smoke fuel in there and you're puffing it because the bees are attacking you and you get all excited and you start puffing a bunch of smoke all over yourself and everything else, this prevents little flaming embers from flying out there. So smokers that have that will stop that action. If you don't have that little spark arrestor in there and you get excited and you start puffing everything, we've all seen the little sparks and flames come out. It's also the smoke coming out of there could be really hot. It hurt the bees. Could have the opposite effect, make them mad. So we're, the goal is to calm the bees. The goal is to drive them into the hive so that they they think that there's a forest fire coming and they're trying to move into the deep bowels of the hive and they're going to sit it out and fan their wings and try to keep the wing, the queen from burning up. So the features are those. I like the double. I like the basket that goes in. Spark arrester. Beyond that, I also like to have some kind of metal cage around it, a standoff. These have cages around here. This bellows is replaceable. There's little nuts here that you can unscrew, take it off, replace the bellows with a new one. These are stainless steel. I don't know that I've ever worn out a smoker. So 14 years, I still have my first smoker, which was garbage. And it's all discolored, of course, and everything, because I ran it too hot. It has bluing, kind of like when you were in high school and you had that motorcycle drag strip bike and all your headers burn blue. It's like that when you run things too hot with your smoker. And uh, I was every parent's dream child when I was in high school. But uh, anyway, those are the features I like to look for. This particular one comes from Flow, but uh, I think everybody sells smokers and uh, those are the features that make them good. Cage around it so it doesn't burn stuff. Some of them even have a little cap for the end. So if you haven't used all the fuel and you want to pack up and leave, uh, you put a little cap or a cork in it or something like that that puts out the fire, saves your fuel so that you can use it later. And then some kind of metal box to put that in because your smoker can still be hot. And when you're driving down the road, if it's in the back of a truck or something, it can actually spark up. So think of a container also for that if you're driving to a bee yard. But those are my features. Those are the favorite one. I will put a link down for those of you who want to see it because in the 
I showed several different designs of smokers that had a lot of creosote built up in them. And you'll be able to see how to clean your smoker. There's a lot of videos on that, so I hope that answered the question. Next question from Paula. Trying to find more information on how to feed spirulina to my bees. I'm assuming you mix it with pollen patties. I usually make them out of Ultra Bee with one-to-one -one sugar syrup. I read the article in American Bee Journal online, but it doesn't specify amounts. When do you usually feed pollen patties? I don't want to build them up too early. We usually get stress, get trees <laughs> starting to bloom in March or April. Should I wait another week or two? My bees went into winter with a good amount of pollen and honey stores. It is always so hard to tell how much they need without pulling frames. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different feed types. And we talked about this earlier on today. Pollen, pollen sub, and pollen patties. Don't feed them in fall, ever. But there's something else. They're called winter patties. And there are patties that are good for the microbiome of the bees. And it helps them put on weight but it does not stimulate them to rear and feed brood. And one of those, I'm glad that uh, Paula brought up the... Spirulina patties. So first of all, what do I do? What's my mix? I don't make them. This is a spirulina patty. Look at it. Do, 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 do. It's like a, it's like clay before you bake it, you know, for those of you who do kiln work. But this is um, healthy bee, it's called. And this spirulina patty, this stuff is so dark. And for those of you who've been watching me know that I put out spirulina for the bees this year. But I put the actual dry powder spirulina, like this, in my sugar syrup going into fall. And I'm also going to put it in the sugar syrup going into spring. And Paul is absolutely right. They don't tell you how much to put in there. But I can tell you that this formula, by the way, we just had a Zoom meeting. This was pretty cool. We just had a Zoom meeting last night with Randy Oliver. Great, and by we, I mean my bee club, my beekeeping organization, Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers. And uh, it was a very good discussion. He gave a presentation specifically on feeding, and I was so glad because everything he was talking about in his presentation, I have it. Because I, do, I don't do testing. I don't even pretend to test on the level that Randy Oliver does. Because we're talking hundreds of hives. We're talking somebody like me, backyard beekeeper, 19 colonies. What can I test? So what I do is I, I read the science. I look at the results. I see what people are studying. I see what works and what's been validated. Peer-reviewed stuff. He made some interesting statements about direct-fed microbials, which a bunch of viewers like to send my way. He proved that they have no significant difference, no significant impact on honeybee health and the microbiome and things like that. So direct-fed microbials on the shelf. But these worked, and there's a difference. There are patties that are designed to produce brood. Those are pollen patties or pollen sub patties. So for example, this is one of them. Here's a pollen patty. 15% of this patty contains actual pollen. So when we put out, and these go directly on top of your brood box inside the hive. So that's why they need to be put on during those warm snaps that we're not getting. So we're in a pickle right now if you've got colonies that didn't have enough stores and resources going on for winter. But when do you put these on? This is where it becomes very important for backyard beekeepers to keep a log. When did your bees start bringing in pollen? When did your environment start providing resources that they needed? The whole purpose behind a pollen patty is to kick off early brood production before the environment starts to provide for everything. So for me, that was March 5th. March 5th to March 15th are when my bees demonstrated that they would most, they were most open to accepting pollen substitutes and pollen patties and things like that. Side by side, if you put Ultra Bee 
uh, winter patties or pollen sub patties next to pollen patties. <laughs> these are tongue twisters. Next to patties that actually have pollen in them, they do recognize and go after the pollen first. So the patties that have real pollen in them, you're going to see a price hike in that too. So when you look at those, Man Lake makes huge uh, feed supplements and resources. They have winter patties. Winter patties, if you're going to put on an emergency feed that will not stimulate brood, the winter patty is what you're looking for. That's what you want to put on because that's not designed to stimulate brood production. Instead, it's to give them carbohydrates and resources to get through winter until spring comes when they do want to rear brood. That's when your pollen patties come in or if you want a cheaper version that still performs, get a pollen sub like Ultra B. Pollen sub patties have been proven to have a positive impact on your bees' ability to build up in spring, including Ultra B pollen sub powder that people put out in feeders so that the foragers can get those and then that brings it through the door. So again, it doesn't matter if it's a if it's a winter patty or a pollen patty or a pollen sub patty, these all sit directly on your brood box inside the hive under your inner cover so that the bees can again be in direct contact with it. And what temperature does it have to be for them to metabolize it? They have to get it up to 51 degrees. That doesn't mean that it has to be 51 degrees outside. It means that the bees themselves, when they're up against it, will generate localized heat 50 degrees or higher so they can metabolize and consume it. Because if it's colder than that, this is also why we don't give them syrup in winter. Colder than that, uh, they can go into shock from the temperature. But they just can't metabolize it. So this stuff, by the way, it is, it is flexible. It bends slow. But the spirulina stuff, this again, some people were mentioning, do my bees have dysentery? Uh, this has proven to have an effect on controlling nosema. So this has already scientifically been evaluated and proven. Spirulina has been proven to be effective in helping the microbiome of the bees and helping bees put on early physical weight. So it doesn't necessarily kick off a bunch of brood, but it does make your bees strong and healthy so that they can continue to do all the tasks that they're assigned to do inside that hive. And uh, Ultra B looks like this, the dry pollen stuff. Distinctive smells, by the way. For some reason, when I walk in the house with this patty, because I had to go out and get it from the garage, my dog smelled this right away and was trying to get it. I think he would have done every trick in the book, just if I would let him eat some of this uh, spirulina. And by the way, the spirulina, the dry spirulina, I should mention this. When I put it into syrup, you cannot just mix one-to-one -one sugar syrup. That's the spring formula. One-to-one -one sugar syrup, and then you think you're going to take a few tablespoons of this and dump it in there and, and mix it all up. That does not work. This stuff clumps on everything, sticks on everything. You get globs of spirulina, and it makes the sugar syrup look ugly. The sugar, the sugar syrup looks darker than this stuff right here. It looks like tar. And uh, so what I found, what I do is I get my mixing bowl together. I figure out it's one-to-one -one sugar syrup by weight. So if I'm putting together a gallon, I have eight pounds of water. I have eight pounds of dry sugar. And then I'm going to take four tablespoons of spirulina to the eight pounds of sugar. And I add it to the dry sugar and I mix it all in. And that all that sugar eventually looks like it's green sugar. Then I add the water to that, warm water, not hot. And then we mix that up and it looks like it's really dark. And guess what? The bees just go nuts for it. So and I didn't start using that until 2020. And uh, the bees show a preference for it. Wasps and hornets go after it too like crazy. So we did lots of that. I did not get to crush bee guts and look at it, but I don't have to because the study's already been done and published and that was in the American Bee Journal, Spirulina. Look that up. So uh, the other thing is the sugars that are used in the healthy bee spirulina patties, these are inverted sugars already. So there's a lot of people that get really caught up in whether the sugar is inverted or not and it saves the bees a step and everything else. So if you're trying to give your bees survival rations without kicking off you know, a bunch of brood, 
I would play with those patties. Anyway, great discussion by uh, Randy Oliver, and he published all of it. So you can go to his website and look at that feeding. So I talked about pollen patties. Do not feed those in the fall, period. Winter patties, those can be fed in the fall, put on as an emergency resource. Pollen sub patties, they also kick off brood production, so those should not go on in the fall. Uh, but they can be used in spring. So, and then when to put them out? Starting anywhere from March 5th. March 5th on, so 5th to the 14th. After that, the good news is the bees will start to ignore it and they'll be using the resources that they're gathering from the environment. So that's what we really want to happen. But you know, we get, you don't know what the weather's gonna do. This year, more than ever, the weather is so unpredictable. So be prepared, once they start their brood, be prepared to continue to feed. Now, do I do that? Would I do that to every colony that I have? Across the board, do I just want mass production? No, I'm a backyard beekeeper. I want my bees to survive. And uh, if the numbers are small and they're small colonies coming into spring, I'm just as excited about that as I am a large colony coming out with big numbers. Uh, the only colonies that I'm going to put any of this feed on would be the ones that went into fall with insufficient resources. I'm not a, you know, I don't provide pollinator services. I'm not looking to get a bunch of honey as a sideline industry to make money. I don't need my bees to come out in these huge numbers like people that have a sideline business would. So my goal is to get them through and get them to survive. And then I like to watch them make it on their own, see who's doing great, see what they're finding, see where they're getting it. So all of these fall supplements, fall feeds, spirulina I put out uh, at a feeding station because uh, I wanted to see if they would even take it. My usual two comparisons, see if they go after regular sugar syrup, spirulina, essential oils, what would they go after? So these are observations that I'm making. I don't need to boost them. Now, if I'm in business, if I uh, wanted to make a bunch of honey, if I needed those numbers to be huge, if I want five or six boxes during the nectar flow and I'm counting on a big honey harvest, Somebody wrote to me today and said that their friend gets 350 pounds of honey off a single hive. And uh, they were asking me questions. I said, well, don't talk to me. If that person's getting 350 pounds off a single hive of bees in Canada, that's your mentor. Talk to that person because honey, massive honey production isn't my goal, period, at all. So I'm only helping the colonies that are weak that need the assistance, and those aren't my breeder colonies. So the ones that did it on their own, that still have plenty of resources, that have good numbers, that have good health and vigor, that don't require mite intervention and things like that, those are my breeder colonies. So I'm helping the colonies that need it. I don't across the board apply this stuff to every one of them. Now, before somebody else suggests this, I'm gonna go ahead and head this off. Please don't put in ultra bee pollen sub, healthy bee, you know, spirulina, and then spirulina syrup, and don't collect all these things together and put them all on one hive. The thing is, you want to know what works and what doesn't. You want to know what works best and what you get the best result from. The only way to determine that is to put these things on your colonies one source, one type of feeding material at a time. And then again, keep notes. Who did better? Who did worse? Who showed no difference? And the more colonies you have, the better able you are to make those comparisons. So I hope that's helpful. But yes, get ready to feed. And on, I'm telling you what I'm doing. On the warmest day, I have some colonies that have me worried. I'm not going to lie. So on the first warm day, one of them is that single box swarm that I have, uh, late season swarm. Uh, as soon as I have a day that hits the 60s, I'm putting feed on that thing. And it's going to be uh, one of these, if it's already in uh, the time zone for when they're starting to build up, I would put pollen patties on them or something because I want them to make it. And I need to review the supplements. So there you go. Next one is from Jonathan Schaefer. 
Hey Fred, I don't know if you had any contact from the Weaver family, but I was curious about how their bees are handling the frost Texas is having. The question I have is, I have a local beekeeper selling nukes the next town over here in central New York, but she said she can't get them to me until the first week of June. Will this be too late to start? These will be my first bees ever, and I would like to start off with three nukes. Nukes are nucleus colonies of bees. If you're getting local nucleus of bees that you're driving to and picking up your way ahead. The fastest buildup for any backyard beekeeper when you're just starting out is going to be a nucleus colony. Why? Because there's frames in there that have every, you know, the, the distribution of labor is already established. You have a queen, she has a retinue, she has nurse bees, they have brood, they have cat brood, they have open brood. So all of these things are going on and it's already functioning. The queen is accepted by the workers. Everything's ready to go. You put those boxes in an eight or 10 frame deep and they're going to build. So if you're starting this out, if the earliest you can get that is June, is that too late? I wouldn't think so for that part of the country. Now, I personally would like to start here in April. So if I'm putting out my own colonies and getting things started, we have to look at the, your optimum time for bringing in either a package or a nucleus of bees for your area is coincident with uh, when your bees would be swarming. Because the bees that other beekeepers in your area have, their prime swarm season also kicks off the idea that the resources in the environment are going to be at their peak and providing for maximum reproduction in those colonies. That's the time that you would plan to have your own beginning because those bees, once you set them up, and of course a brand new colony, you're going to probably help them out with some kind of feed supplement. Uh, but once they get going, you see that they're bringing in all the pollen that they've sourced everything, there's no reason to continue to feed them. So June, actually, you've missed April and May, which are big blossom fruit trees, crab apples, all these things are blossoming during that period. Now we hit June. June for some areas is actually a declining time when it comes to nectar and pollen resources for your bees. So just know that if you get those, it's great that you're getting them locally. That's a bonus because you know your queen's not gonna be injured through heat extremes and things like that in transit. You also know the keeper. You also know the line of bees. You also know what their rhythm would be. And uh, I think that's a benefit. So, but yeah, it's, it's a little late, but you're just starting out. What do you want to do with them? We want them to survive. You know, the general thinking is that you don't plan to get anything from your bees through the first year and then find out what the different nectar flows are for your area. Where I live, the nectar flows are continuous from spring right through fall. So I'm in a sweet spot. You may not be. So that's where you're going to find this information from that person there. But... Uh, just across the board, starting off with a nucleus package like that, is, which is different from a regular package of bees, the nucleus is ready to go. I think you're in good shape because you're ahead of what a package would have to do to build up. And there's no break in the brood, by the way. So you put a package in, let's say you compare that. So let's put a package, let's install a package in the first week of May. When will you start seeing adult workers emerging? at the end of the month, at the earliest. So you're already in June before you start seeing adults. When you get your nucleus of bees, you have adults emerging every day right there, uninterrupted brood. So yeah, you might actually be on par. Next one is from Chuck Trost, Buffalo, New York. Let's see, newly back to beekeeping and after being away for 20 years. Question, yesterday I cleared the entrance of a hive of winter drops. Most, if not all, had their tongues out. Is this an indication of starving or just a normal way winter bee deaths are? I doubt this is insecticide death. I also doubt that it's insecticides because we're at the wrong time of year for people to be spreading uh, pesticides of any kind. So, but the tongues being out, yep, that's a problem for me. I think that tongues being out does indicate that they were starving. The other indicator, physiological indicator, when we're looking at a dead bee, look at the abdomen of the bee. Is it contracted? Are they what's called short bees? Are their abdomens shrunk up a little bit? If they are partnered with the tongue sticking out like that, 
Yeah, they starved. And we go back to something I said earlier, lift the hive, tilt the hive. How heavy is it? Uh, if they're out of food, they're out of food. And uh, that could be the explanation for why they're dead. And here's the thing about just posing a question. We don't get to have an exchange of, and I can't ask questions about what other indicators there might be, but uh, it sounds like they starved. And that's a hard hit for people because starving, the bee starving is something that we can head off. So we can provide for them. So the next question is from T. Vinny's, Vinny's, Vinny's. Thanks for taking the time to make these great videos. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for watching. I have a question. What are the positive or negatives using a canvas inner cover compared to traditional wooden inner covers? I wish I had. Well, first of all, when we look at the bees and we look at the hives, we have the bottom board, we have the box, which has brood in it. Then we have honey supers. Then we have an inner cover. Then we have an outer cover. And there are different designs available. I wish I had an example to show you what a canvas inner cover would look like. So let me break out my little educational box. So this would represent the upper honey super on your box of bees. Or if you just started out, then it's the only box you have. So we have the telescoping cover on top. Let's pull that off. Do, 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 do. The next thing you would expect to see under this would be the inner cover, which has a feeding hole in it. A lot of people think that feeding hole is a vent. It is not. Ever since its inception, the purpose of that hole is to provide feed resources for your bees. So that's a standard inner cover. Now, one of the options is a canvas cover. So let's say I had one of those. It would look like this. This would take the place of your inner cover. So I know I look like uh, Wilson on tool time right now, but I'm hiding behind the bees. One of the advantages for this is, and where do I get my canvas? I'm an artist, I'm a painter, and uh, this is cotton dye canvas that you would paint with. So the thing is, when you peel this up, you can peel this back as you go, and it's in direct contact with the frames themselves, and the bees would propolize it, so it would be sealed to this. So the advantage is that it creates this impervious barrier, that it is going to give you access to your bees, and as you peel it back, you can go from this side, or you can go from this side, and look only at the frames you want to, while keeping the cover on, and keeping your bees nice and calm and happy as you go. They become impregnated with propolis and the wax buildup and everything else, and they are in direct contact with your bees. So what's the problem with it? One of the problems is that uh, you can't put a feeder on that. We can't put one of these patties on top of that because the bees can't feed through it. There's no hole. So it's for colonies that would not have a hive top feeder. They might have an entrance feeder. They might have a frame feeder inside. So uh, the thing of it is, it's convenient. First of all, if you have a bunch of canvas inner covers, they're dirt cheap. They're in direct contact with the frames. Nothing moves over the top of the frames. We eliminated hiding places and everything else for small hive beetles and things like that. There's a convenience to peeling it off to looking at that. Uh, you can throw a whole bunch of them in a satchel where you're not going to get a bunch of inner covers if you're transporting equipment. You're not going to carry a satchel with 50 inner covers on it. So again, if you're larger scale, the canvas inner cover might make perfect sense. It allows some airflow through it. So it is a canvas. It's a tight weave. Mine is heavy cotton duck unprimed. Uh, so there could be some moderate airflow through there. So there again, it provides some moisture escape maybe through the top for those of you who like to do that. And the bees again will decide what they want to seal up. It's a coarse surface. So then the bees propolize it. And what's that do? creates a propolis envelope on the ceiling of the interior of the hive, which means now it's antibacterial. Now it's a disease resistance for the colony itself. So the more propolis coating there is on the interior surfaces of the hive, the better they are to fend off disease. So I hope that helps. But uh, yeah, it's a thing. So you can do that. You just can't put a feeder on top. And that was it for today. So now we're on the fluff part. By the way, 
If you want to keep track of these videos that you watch, don't forget to click the like button down there so that you'll know when you see that you like it, that you've already watched this one. Join us on Facebook, The Way To Be Fellowship. There'll be a link down in the video description for that. You can follow this on podcast, Podbean, uh, The Way To Be. So if you just want to listen to the audio version of this while you mow or drive or do something like that, great following there that's growing. Our Way To Be Fellowship on Facebook is growing a lot. So the good news about that is you get a lot of different opinions and no questions are too basic. No topics are too sophisticated. The only rule is that you be nice to people while we're trying to learn and share about bees. The moderators there are outstanding. So if you're going to feed in spring, you're good to feed pollen subs. You're good to feed pollen patties. Again, big price difference there. Slight performance edge to the things. Go to Randy Oliver's uh, Scientific Beekeeping and read about which ones are working the best. He also publishes in the American Bee Journal, so his articles are going to be coming out soon. Uh, what else? Check your boxes, tilt them, bump up against them, see if they might be light, see if they need feed. Clear your landing boards, and uh, that's it. We're thinking about those of you who are without power. So I hope things go your way soon. If you have issues with bees that are in the cold now when you've never dealt with that before, please go to the Way to Be Fellowship and see if people can give you answers and pointers, specifically people that are down where you are. Those are your best helpers, those with past experience with things like that. So I hope you enjoyed today. Thanks for being here, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again.